Welcome to the webinar series in the Center for Subsurface Energy and the Environment. Uh, my name is Matt Balhoff. I'm the director of the center and a professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. To learn more about the research that we're doing in this area, please visit our website and also uh, join our LinkedIn group uh, to learn about future webinars and, and other uh, research that we are doing. In the center, we are a group of faculty and principal investigators. There's about 26 of us, as you can see here. In the center, we work on a number of subsurface applications. We use various technical disciplines, and we also use a large variety of engineering tools to solve these problems. We collaborate with industry many different ways, one of those being with our industrial affiliate programs some of which you can see here. The most recent one is on carbon utilization storage and transportation, and we're also starting one on sustainability and net zero. If you're interested in any of these IAPs, then please contact uh, me or, or the center. These uh, monthly webinar are informative industry-driven webinars by researchers and collaborators within the center. They are hosted the second Tuesday of each month at noon via Teams. Uh, this is a change from last year when we were doing them on Fridays. All webinars are uploaded to our YouTube channel within a few days. If you'd like to watch it or rewatch it there, although we encourage live participation. Some upcoming webinars, Dr. Silvio Levescu uh, has a webinar next month on acid stimulation during the energy transition. And in March, Dr. Kwok Nguyen will be giving a webinar. Uh, after the webinar, please post, or, or during, please post your questions in the Q&A section, um, and the speaker will answer as many questions as possible at the end. Uh, we encourage you to post those questions as soon as possible. Uh, today's webinar is Reservoir Engineering Approaches Towards the Energy Transition. Uh, given by Dr. Wen Song. Dr. Song is a, an assistant professor in the Hildebrand Department of Petroleum and Geosystems Engineering and also a member of our center. She received her PhD at Stanford University and her eight research aims to understand the multi-phase reactive transport mechanisms that control energy and environmental processes and natural and in an engineered porous media. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Song. OK, um, well, thanks, Matt, for the introduction. So hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Wen Song. Um, I'm an assistant professor here in the department and in the Center for Subsurface Engineering and the Environment. Um, and so today I thought that I would discuss a little bit about some of the work that we've been uh, researching in my group uh, towards developing and using reservoir engineering approaches uh, that help enable the energy transition. So just a brief uh, motivation, um, you know, the, the goal of our work is really to provide energy in a reliable and sustainable way to our society. And so as you can see here, over the last 200, 300 years, um, right, we've really had an exponential growth in terms of the amount of energy that we've used in our society. And so starting with about the uh, the Industrial Revolution, we've really adopted widely the use of uh, fossil fuel resources. So for example, coal, crude oil, and natural gas, as you can see here. And that's really been the main driver toward enabling our current uh, standard of living and you know, modernization of our society. And so while that's all been really fantastic, we can also see on this bottom plot here that uh, with the use of these crude oil uh, or fossil um, fossil fuel resources, we've also seen a, a huge increase in the amount of CO2 emissions that we've emit, uh, you know, released to the atmosphere. And so, you know, that's tracked fairly strongly with the amount of uh, energy use that we've um, seen in our, uh, uh, our global society. And if you measure the total atmospheric CO2 concentration concentrations, you can also see that we've seen an exponential uh, rise in that. And of course, with that, we have some important implications toward climate. And so 
because our goal is to really enable this transition toward a low carbon energy future, there are two main types of resources or energy resources that were uh, very interested in in my group. And so they broadly break down into two categories. So one are the fluid resources. Um, and so here, for example, kind of our traditional um, energy fluid energy uh, resource is hydrocarbons, right? And we're going to continue to need this uh, for our transportation sector. Um, but also as we, you know, been producing more and more CO2 and releasing that into the atmosphere, the other question is how do we, you know, control uh, and mitigate this effect in terms of capturing this from point sources or distributed sources um, and then sequestering that and storing that in the subsurface in a secure and safe manner. The other part of this transition comes from the mineral resources. And so, for example, as we bring more and more electric vehicles online, we're going to be needing more and more of the uh, battery materials, for example, for energy storage within the, uh, the transportation um, of these vehicles. And so, for example, lithium and cobalt are important minerals that we're interested in. Um, and similarly, as we bring more and more renewable uh, resources online, we're going to be needing the technology uh, to convert these, for example, the kinetic energy that's in wind into, for example, something that we can use like electricity. And so with that, we're going to be needing uh, massive volumes of uh, magnets and semiconductors uh, to enable this transition. And so fundamentally, all of these resources that I've talked about really deal with geologic systems. And so, for example, in this, you know, cross section of, a, of you know, a, some part of Earth, um, we can, for example, extract hydrocarbons, as we know in this community uh, fairly well. Um, but we can also, for example, store uh, captured CO2 in these deep saline aquifers or other uh, types of systems on Earth. Um, similarly, with electric vehicles, um, the lithium that we require for our batteries uh, typically either come from mined ore, or uh, as in the case of you know the solars in South America, we are extracting the lithium out of brine uh, and evaporating them. And similarly, with respect to other minerals that we need for magnets and semiconductors, right? These are all coming out of our uh, geologic materials and, and then we of course treat them and uh, process them to manufacture them into something useful. So overall really this is uh, you know we're, we're dealing with a system uh, that is in the subsurface or or near you know below the surface of the of, of the earth um, and so typically when we're talking about subsurface systems or reservoir engineering, we're dealing with several uh, orders of magnitude. And so typically when we think about kind of in the traditional oil and gas field, we're talking about a, a, a field scale system where, you know, we might be spanning uh, on the order of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers. But typically we like to compartmentalize them and model them as individual reservoirs. And those might be on the order of meters to hundreds of meters. But if we're really interested in understanding how best to control the transport and reaction and, and recovery or management of these resources, we need to understand what's going on at the fundamental level. And typically for us, the fundamental level is at the pore scale where you know we're at the micrometer or nanometer length scales. And so Really what my group is interested in is understanding the physical chemical uh, interactions and dynamics that are occurring within these submillimeter kind of fundamental pore and interfacial levels. And so the types of questions that we're interested in is, for example, how do multiple uh, fluid phases um, behave within these systems in terms of their transport, in terms of the sorption of various different minerals onto and away from these uh, rock and, and uh, fluid interfaces and what is the reactions uh, that are what are the reactions that are controlling uh, this this um, extractive process for example and so really the main question that you know uh, we want to understand and address is how do we actually go about studying these physical chemical dynamics um, within these very kind of complicated uh, and and heterogeneous systems that are confined to the submillimeter length scales. And so one very uh, useful approach to this is the use of microfluidics. And so here I have an example of a microfluidic device. 
right? So actually in, in this picture, there's four different devices. And so here in each one, you know, you can have these etched channels that are, you know, seven millimeter in dimension. And we can then flow in whatever fluids we're interested in, for example, and throw this under a microscope to visualize in real time and at the right and and at the right length scales. So the several millimeter, so micrometer typically, uh, length scales of what's going on within these complicated systems. And so an example of that here is, uh, for example, um, you know, using these these simple systems to study. Uh, the interactions that are occurring between two miscible fluids. And so in this study, for example, we have a microscale Healy Shaw cell where we effectively have uh, two flat plates um, and and we can then, you know, really try to understand how different fluid pairs are behaving uh, when they're being confined in this way. And so in this particular example, we studied how two completely miscible fluids uh, uh, behave and what we were able to actually find was something very uh, exciting and interesting um, and it was a little bit unexpected right so here what you just saw was the uh, con the contact between two completely miscible fluid pairs uh, uh, two miscible fluids and what you saw was the formation of these highly uh, fractal like fingers that developed um, with no external forcing. And so because of the simplicity of microfluidics, we're also able to perform numerous amounts uh, of these experiments to really characterize, for example, the, uh, the fractal dimensionality and the flow uh, behavior within you know, these different phases and then come up with a mechanistic uh, description of what's going on within these systems. And so that is a, an example of how microfluidics can be used to really try to tease out some of these fundamental um, interfacial level interactions. But as I uh, mentioned earlier, typically we're dealing with subsurface systems that have a high degree of complexity in terms of their core geometry. And so what we do here in terms of achieving that pore geometry is we can, for example, take a picture of a real rock. And so this could be any type of geologic material they're interested in. So in this example, we've chosen an unconsolidated sandstone. So here are these yellow, white and orange uh, regions are the solid grains um, and the dark blue are the pore spaces where fluids are able to flow through. And so what we can then do is take a effectively image processing approach on this picture and convert that to a binarized uh, image where you know these black regions are the grains and the the transparent or the white regions are the pore spaces where fluids could potentially travel through. And so now using standard fluid lithography. Uh, and ion etching uh, approaches, we can we can effectively transfer this pattern onto a substrate. And so here I have a picture of an SEM of a of an etched silicon device where you know you can see that these channels have been etched away. So these were the regions where you know the the transparent regions where we were able to where we wanted the pore spaces to be. Um, and so now you can see that, for example fluid are able to fluids are able to occupy these spaces um, and the last thing to do is to then you know uh, confine this from the top so that you know the fluids are able to flow through in in two dimensions um, and so we can you know conceal uh, confine this with a uh, with a transparent material like glass um, that we can then throw this device under a microscope to really understand how our multiple phases of fluids are behaving um, in real time. And so this is a really fantastic approach because you can really use this to develop any type of geometry that you're interested in. And so, for example, um, a number of different geometries have been developed in the past. So for example, you know, here I showed an unconsolidated sandstone that might be representative of, you know, a, a deep ocean sediment, or uh, you can also you know, develop a Berea sandstone that might be more of a um, uh, more appropriate for a CO2 storage type of site or a, a hydrocarbon storage type of site um, recovery. Um, and, and similarly, you can also take a carbonate geometry, um, really any kind of pore geometry that you're interested in, you can you can use this process and transfer that into a 
a substrate um, to visualize for fluid flow. So this is all really exciting because now for the first time we're able to view uh, in real time and at the right length scales the interactions between the fluids and how they're competing with each other within these confined and complicated pore spaces. But what's still missing, as we know, is the mineralogy. So typically in our uh, geologic systems, we have a high degree of heterogeneity with respect to the minerals uh, that make up that material. And so the real challenge here is, can we somehow replicate the, uh, the heterogeneities in mineralogy and this, the representative surface characteristics uh, that come along with the, uh, the heterogeneous mineralogy within our systems? And so this is really kind of what my group has focused on is in terms of developing um, these reactive transport micro models uh, to enable the study of, you know, reactive transport processes within these systems. And so, for example, we can see uh, here that we've actually functionalized um, some of our high pressure systems with calcite. Um, so this, uh, these white bright regions are calcite grains that have been grown in situ within the micro model. And so now we can, for example, study the reactive transport um, through these you know, mixed carbonate and silica systems. Or similarly, we can actually etch these geometries directly into um, a calcite crystal. And so here you can see that actually um, we've developed a porous material into the calcite itself. And, and you can then use it to study, for example, the dissolution of this calcite when you have an acidified brine, uh, for example. Um, similarly, we can also functionalize these systems with other materials like clay particles, and that's a very representative system of many sandstone uh, materials in the world. Um, and we can then use that to study, for example, uh, hydrocarbon recovery or the growth of hydrates. Uh, and this is something that I'll discuss later on in the, uh, in the talk. Um, most recently, we've also started to look at finer length scales, and so we're much more interested in, for example, what happens at the interfacial level, so at the nanoscale level, um, and also what happens within nanoporous materials. And so um, in geologic settings, mudstones are typically nanoporous, and so here we're, we're, uh, we're able to actually visualize, you know, these, these types of fluid rock interactions in real time and that's been a really exciting um, new area for us uh, as well as the study of minerals recovery from these uh, nanoporous materials as well. So in today's talk I thought that I would give two kind of uh, vignettes in terms of what we're doing uh, with CO2 storage in uh, geologic systems and so the first vignette is really um, assessing and understanding the mechanisms that underlie the security of uh, CO2 that's stored in carbonates. And so the motivation for this is really knowing the fact that carbonates are a ubiquitous material. Um, and for example, they host over half of the world's hydrocarbon resources. And so we know that they are very good reservoirs to store you know, materials, fluid, fluid materials in. And so here, what we did was we started out um, uh, an experiment at the interfacial level, and we discovered a mechanism that well, I'll get into a little bit later, but it's effectively uh, called a grain engulfment mechanism. And we then can take this up into higher degrees of complexity um, and understand how this mechanism is uh, dominant uh, or not at the poor, poor ensemble and reservoir scales. And so here what we've done is we really started out with a very simple set of experiments. So here we have a single calcite grain that is embedded in a non-reactive uh, polymer channel. And so the reason for doing this is so that we can ensure that there is uh, a controlled concentration of acid as well as uh, a flow rate um, at this you know, reactive interface. Um, and so in, in doing this, what we're able to do is visualize in real time uh, how this, you know, this calcite grain is dissolving. And so what we find is that because of the uh, wetting of the calcite um, and because of the reactive transport, the competition between reaction and transport um, at the interface, that in fact CO2 
um, is able to be produced as a separate phase. Um, and because of the local wetting of the calcite, the CO2 is actually retained on the surface of the calcite. And it therefore uh, in, it grows around the calcite grain until uh, it effectively collapses onto itself, which we'll see in a second here. Um, right here, right? And so at this point, the calcite grain has collapsed or the, the CO2 has collapsed around the calcite grain entirely and I has isolated the calcite grain from the aqueous phase. And so now we no longer have a direct reaction interface. And so at this particular grain, the local reaction is halted. And so this was something that was very interesting to us. And, um, and you know, we can really do this uh, experiment a number of times and really kind of characterize and quantify um, the rates at which, you know, this reaction is occurring and um, and how important this engulfment effect is locally on the rate at which dissolution is occurring. And so, you know, effectively we can do image processing on the size of this brain. Um, and what we see is that as soon as acid injection um, occurs, so as soon as acid makes contact with the interface of the calcite, we start to see a rapid and constant rate of dissolution until the grain engulfment event occurs, after which we no longer have any uh, local dissolution at this grain. And so this was really exciting, and we wanted to map out the regimes under which this would be uh, dominant. And so what we find is that in systems where the rate of CO2 production from this reaction is slow compared to the rate at which CO2 is able to dissolve into the aqueous phase and be infected away from that interface, then we end up with a single phase system. And this is really what we had um, known about in the literature previously. Um, but in cases where the rate of reaction is rapid in comparison to the rate at which it's the CO2 is able to dissolve into the aqueous phase. So for example, if you were to be close to a CO2 injector where the brine might already be close to saturated or, or already saturated with CO2, then in that case, um, we will ha have a separate CO2 phase form. And in the case where the rate of abduction of CO2 away from that reactive interface is slow, then we, we are able to accumulate enough gas so that the grains are able to be protected or engulfed um, by this mechanism. And so this was really exciting because this is a mechanism that we hadn't really thought of previously, um, but we wanted to understand how the complexity of the porous geometry would influence the significance of this uh, mechanism. And so what we then did was perform these experiments in, uh, in a micromodel, so in a you know, a, a rock geometry. And so here we started out with our etched silicon system. And so here you can see again, these darker patches are the grains, the lighter regions are the pore spaces where fluids are able to migrate through. Um, and so here we, we have the representative pore geometry, but we're lacking the reactive uh, part of this uh, problem. And so because this is etched silicon, Right, silicon is a relatively inert material, and so we needed to first functionalize the system with uh, calcite. And so the way we did that was by using this uh, very special bacteria. And so in fact, these little black specks in the pore space are the bacteria that have been uh, deposited into the system. And this is a very special bacteria in that it's able to secrete carbonate ions and buffer them just right so that when we inject our cementation fluid, which is effectively calcium ions, um, then we can start to precipitate and grow these calcite grains in situ. And so what you've just seen here um, is the growth of these kind of bright white uh, grains that have, that, that have been nucleated uh, and grown in situ in our system. And they're very stable. And so this occurs over a couple of hours and, and what we can then get is a system that is well functionalized with, uh, with these reactive grains. And so here, these white 
uh, regions are the calcite grains that have been grown in situ. And by controlling the, the flow of the fluids, we can also control where the calcite is being deposited. And so here, for example, we can line the edges of these cal uh, silicon grains uh, with calcite. So now using this calcite functionalized platform, we can then really use it to try to understand the significance of this grain engulfment phenomenon. Uh, and so here what we've done is uh, replicate those same experiments at the same condition, so close to ambient. Um, and what we see is the protection of these grains um, by the CO2 from this dissolution process. And so that was great. And if you zoom in, for example, here we start out with these two grains of calcite. Um, that are initially both protected by this CO2 bubble, um, but because of some flow instability within our system, then we get snap off, uh, which we'll see in a second right here. And so now this bottom grain is exposed to the acidified brine, and you can see that, of course, now it's dissolving rapidly. However, this top grain up here that's still being protected by the CO2 bubble is relatively uh, inert. And we can then quantify this uh, by really measuring the area of, uh, of the grains. Um, and what we see then is as soon as the acid makes contact with the grains, that the, the exposed grains are dissolving rapidly, whereas the engulfed or the protected grains are, are, uh, are effectively protected from, from dissolution. And so that stops. So this was really great um, because it shows that the added uh, 2D system um, does in fact, you know, still behave similarly, um, albeit with a little bit more complexity. Um, but these experiments again were performed at close to ambient conditions. And typically when we store CO2, these are deep systems where we want to take advantage of, uh, you know, high density and low viscosity uh, properties of the CO2 while it's you know a supercritical fluid and so what we then did was perform these experiments at these elevated pressure and temperature conditions um, and so in this case we did two sets of experiments one to mimic the system far from a co2 injector where the brine is relatively untouched by co2 and so it has a high solubility of for co2 um, if any were to emerge uh, from this uh, reaction and again, we're performing these at elevated temperature and pressures so that if CO2 were to come out as a separate phase, it would be supercritical. And so at these conditions, um, you can see that far from the CO2 injector. So right, so this is in that in, within that phase diagram, this would be in regime one where we have a, a high rate of solubility um, for CO2 in the aqueous phase then we see that effectively this is occurring as a single phase reactive transport process uh, where the rate at which the calcite is being dissolved is relatively constant and linear. So that's really not uh, very surprising to us. Uh, and so what we then did was perform the same experiment but at conditions that would represent something that's close to the CO2 injector. And so here what we expect close to the CO2 injector is uh, that the brine is already pre-saturated with CO2. Um, and so any additional CO2 that comes out of this reaction would likely form as a separate phase. And that's precisely what we have here. And so here you can see that all of these bubbles, um, right, are actually CO2, supercritical CO2 bubbles that have formed because of this reaction. And you can see again that the grains that are protected by the CO2 are of course protected from dissolution, so that's good. Um, and if we zoom in, you can see that uh, in this video, for example, as the acidified brine uh, comes in uh, and makes contact with this grain, for example, we start to see dissolution, but also the formation of these bubbles of supercritical CO2 around the grain. And so as, as more and more of these bubbles accumulate and coalesce, then we start to get these, uh, oops, these uh, larger uh, uh, ganglia of CO2 bubbles that are then able to protect the calcite grain from dissolution, and that's precisely what we've seen. And so here in this study, 
what we've really done is go from the fundamental interfacial level in 1D um, and what we've done is discover a new mechanism that really controls the dissolution of CO2 within these systems while we're storing um, CO2 in the subsurface and then try to understand the significance and impact of this at the pore and pore ensemble scales and then really draw um, some uh, conclusions about what would behave, what would happen within the reservoir um, and kind of locations of where this might be important if we were to actually store CO2 um, in these carbonate systems. Um, so just to summarize, really, uh, what I've shown here is the use of reservoir engineering approaches like using microfluidics and micromodels to study different approaches to reducing the amount of carbon that we uh, release our, uh, into the atmosphere. And so what our group works on is really developing the infrastructure at the micro and nanoscale levels to understand the reactive transport uh, within these porous systems. Um, and we can then use these uh, platforms to discover fundamental processes uh, like the grain engulfment effect uh, that dominates you know, reactive transport in carbonates um, close to the CO2 injector site, for example, or this new mechanism of film growth, uh, self-propagating film growth within hydrates um, that then, you know, have real world impacts in terms of understanding the security of CO2 that's stored in these carbonate systems or uh, how these hydrates actually form um, within, uh, within, you know, these oceanic sediment systems. So with that, I'd like to uh, conclude and acknowledge my graduate students and our funding agencies. Um, really, a lot of the hydrates work was done by uh, David Fukuyama, uh, and so, uh, you know, this is really a reflection of their work. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. So, so uh, when this is Matt, uh, at the beginning, you talked a little bit about lithium and minerals. Um, have you given any thought to what are some of the reservoir engineering challenges and opportunities um, for lithium? Lithium, uh, you know, a big part of the lithium resource comes from brine, um, which is pumped from sure. you know, a high desert. And so, yeah, so so I think there's there's definitely some questions with respect to um, you know controlling the rate at which we can produce uh, you know the the brines from these systems um, and really managing those reservoirs I think that would be an easy um, reservoir engineering problem um, in terms of kind of the the micro scale reactive transport um, yeah I mean if there's lithium in the brine then you know, of course, there must be a, a rock material that ha that is highly concentrated in lithium. Um, and so how can we potentially, uh, you know, improve the concentration of or the purity of lithium, uh, you know, in the brine and then also during the extraction process? Um, OK, so there's a question. Uh, related to the CO2 hydrates. Do we have any field trials or large scale experiments on this technique? I appreciate if you comment more about the feasibility of this technique. Um, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not aware of uh, CO2 hydrate field trials. I know that there's been a number of um, pilots at the reservoir level um, with respect to extracting methane hydrates um, that have run into you know various different problems with respect to the stability of the sediment um, because you know a lot of these systems the sediments are held uh, by the hydrates um, so they're stabilized and cemented by the hydrates and so you know as you start to remove the hydrate from that system then it becomes very hard for the sediments to remain stable. And so, you know, they, they effectively have, they start to produce um, 
uh, sand out of the wells and that's not good. Um, but I'm yeah, I'm not sure about uh, field experiments with um, CO2 hydrates in the ocean sediments. Is there any plan for piloting either of these techniques? Um, I, I don't have personal plans to pilot uh, <laughs> these techniques, but you know, perhaps uh, there might be other people who would be interested in that. Would the CO2 hydrate storage allow displacement of the methane as a CO2 versus methane exchange? Yeah, so that's definitely something that we're very interested in. So, um, you know, one thing to consider is the fact that, you know, that so in the map that I showed, um, there's there's a lot of uh, oceanic sediment that hosts methane hydrates uh, potentially, and you know, it would be great if we can you know, basically do something that's like CO2 EOR in traditional reservoir engineering systems where we inject CO2 and produce methane at the same time. Um, so yeah, so and then that could potentially be that's that's something that people have thought of uh, in terms of stabilizing the sediment too, right? So in the system where if you're extracting the methane out um, and you're destabilizing that sediment uh, because you're turning basically ice into water, um, then if you were to, you know, re-solidify the hydrate but add a CO2 hydrate, then, you know, then, then you wouldn't run into the problem of producing the sand. So yes, that is a great question. Oh, um, any comments or insights on reactor transport and clastic rocks? Um, well, uh, for CCS and CCUS purposes, um, I mean, in terms of clastics, they're relatively um, inert compared to the carbonates. Uh, and so, you know, I think that's a that's a pretty well understood problem. Um, but, you know, I guess one question is potentially the wetting of CO2 within these uh, systems. So if you have, you know, a clay rich you know, sandstone, for example, um, how does the CO2 compete in terms of transport or um, or capillarity uh, with water? I guess that could be something that's studied. All right, well, uh, I just want to thank everyone for attending and especially thank our speaker, Dr. Wen Song. Uh, just as a reminder, our webinars are posted on our YouTube channel, uh, so if you want to go back and and see some old webinars, uh, then they are available there and Dr. Songs will be up there in the future. Uh, we also encourage you to visit our website and to join our LinkedIn page to learn uh, about new announcements, future webinars and uh, other research directions that we're working on. Uh, thank you.